All right, crew. Hello and welcome back. I'm looking over to the side because I have a virtual guest today. So I'm very excited about it because this guest is an expert in gut health and acne and things that you should be eating or maybe shouldn't be eating. Maybe it's time to cut the dairy finally, as many of us have heard over and over again, including myself. I was reminded of this because I just got back from LA and I went and got ice cream and my stomach went crazy. And I got a little excited because I was on vacation And then I ended up getting a few acne, you know, pieces in specific areas on my face, which happened to be related to the gut. And I was like, oh my God, this is all intertwined. Once again, a reminder of why I need to cut dairy, but I'm not going to preach to the choir. You probably maybe already knew that, um, or maybe knew you need to cut something out. But today I'm answering all your questions related to the skin gut connection, um, things from like things you should eat. What are the problem? How to get rid of acne scars at home, how to clean up my gut what is a sign that my skin is actually not an oily type of skin, but maybe it's a stage of skin, right? Um, All things from that to anti-aging creams, are they really the best thing for it? Can we reverse um, uh, graying hair or aging hair, I almost said? I will hit all of these things, period, breakouts, you name it, we're going to talk about it. But without further ado, let's get into it. Hello, Maria. Maria is here on the podcast. Maria Marlowe, how are you doing today? I'm so good. Thank you for having me, Sydney. Of course. Welcome to Well Said Podcast. I'm really excited to have this conversation because I have wanted slash been wanting to have this conversation for a long time. And I had my listeners write in and they were like, I need to have an episode about gut and skin connection. And it just so happens we got connected around the same exact time. And I, I started creeping on you and creeping on your TikTok. Turns out I'd already seen a few of your TikToks because I had been deep on the gut skin journey and you've got a ton of good content on there. And I want to dive into it today because there's so, so much to get to. So I'm very, very excited for this conversation. Do you mind introducing yourself, giving everybody just a tiny little elevator pitch so they know who we're talking to? Sure. So my name is Maria. I am known as the acne nutritionist and I think as you can probably imagine I became an acne nutritionist because I had really bad acne and the only thing that solved it was actually changing my diet. So over 10 years ago, I um, discovered this concept of food as medicine, drastically changed my diet, my skin cleared up. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. Why doesn't anyone teach us this? So I decided to study nutrition and cooking. And fast forward to today, I am a certified nutritionist and I specialize in acne. I've done um, additional coursework in holistic or integrative dermatology and really focused my research and studying acne uh, because I think it's fascinating. And as we'll get to in the episode, there's actually a lot of evidence to suggest there's a very, very strong link between our diet, uh, acne, and our gut and acne, and even stress and acne. So uh, this is going to be a a great episode. I'm very excited for that. And I'm lucky that I've never struggled hard with acne, right? Like I don't consider myself on the extreme spectrum, but I definitely struggle with breakouts here and there. Like I've, I definitely get them in specific parts of my face that I'd like to think mean something, but it's so funny. There's nowhere you really can go to find this information. Like, I mean, yes, you can Google, like, is this from X? Like, is my acne from dairy? Like I alluded to, or, or is it from something else? Or is it from my makeup? Or is it from my pillow that might be dirty? Or am I stressed out? It's hard to figure it out. It's hard to nail it down. I'd be curious for you and your journey before we dive into questions as what did you try before you decided, okay, maybe it's food because that's, it's really kind of still a buzzy hot topic that not a lot of people know about quite yet. Yeah. So food was really my last resort. I had acne for almost five years and it started, or I started off doing all the common things, you know, going to the drugstore, getting topical, Clearasil and clean and clear and the apricot scrub, which we all know now is a really oh my bad goodness. idea. <laughs> um, and then I kind of graduated to going to the dermatologist and I was prescribed first topical medications and oral mm-hmm. medications like antibiotics. I was prescribed birth control, spironolactone. Oh, yep. And I was kind of just like on this totem pole testing different medications for several months at a time. And 
my skin sometimes didn't improve or sometimes it improved while I was on it, but then I would get off it and then my skin would come back, like it would come back worse um, oftentimes. And so I was really discouraged to be quite honest. And I thought there was something wrong with me because I was doing all the steps. I'm like a type A personality. So if you tell me to do X, Y, and Z, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. I'm going to do it to a T. And I'm like, what the heck is wrong with me? None of this stuff is working. And, uh, you know, towards the end of that period, I was prescribed Accutane, mm -hmm. now isotretinoin. And um, I actually, I filled the prescription and I remember, you know, picking it up from the drugstore and stapled to that front is that piece of paper that has all the side effects and the instructions and everything. And I happened to read one of the side effects, which was severe depression that could lead to suicide. And I was like, I'm already pretty depressed about my skin. None of the other drugs have worked so far. And I'm not willing to take this. Like, I'm actually, I'm not going to take this prescription. And so there I was just like, okay, I'm cursed. I have bad luck. I have bad genes. Because I had an older brother, or I have an older brother and a younger sister, and they had some breakouts, but like it, they were not as bad as mine. They had other health issues, but for me, acne was like my main issue. And uh, so kind of fast forward, I get to college and I'm like sitting at lunch one day with this girl and eating, you know, two slices of pizza and men's chocolate chip cookies and a soda and, uh, you know, complaining about my skin. And she's like, oh, you know, it might be caused by what you're eating. And I'm like, you know, I almost spit my, you know, Coke out of my yeah, nose, exactly. not <laughs> Coca-Cola <laughs> out of my nose and was like, um, you know, that's, I mean, that's crazy. Like I've been to all these different dermatologists and not one of them have ever even asked me what I'm eating. Mm -hmm. And so she's like, no, here, check out this dermatologist who is a little bit more holistic minded. And um, she's like, yeah, why don't you kind of explore this? Try eating a more whole food, organic diet. And long story short, I completely overhauled my diet. My skin cleared up in three months after five years. Okay. And I was like, I actually didn't believe it. I literally thought like I was like praying to God. I was oh like, God. God must have answered my prayers because there's no way that How? the food changing my diet. I was like, there's no way. So I actually went back to eating pizza and cookies and Coca-Cola and all that stuff. And my, the pimples came back right away. And so I can see in the mirror very clearly that when I ate broccoli and wild salmon with turmeric on it and brown rice, my skin was calmer. It was flatter. There was less redness. There were less pumps. When I would eat pizza and cookies, my skin was angry. It was red. There were bumps. There was inflammation. And so it was actually like that second time where I kind of like relapsed. And then I was like, okay, actually, I guess it is the food yeah. um, that I was like, okay, this is it. And that's where I kind of became this nutrition junkie and wanted to learn everything and anything that I could about food and cooking. Because I imagine like up until that point, I only knew how to, you know, open a package out of the freezer and put yes. it in the microwave. I didn't know how to cook. Yes. I didn't know what parsley or cilantro were like. I didn't know what any of this stuff was. And so that was, uh, yeah, that was really like the turning point and the, the point of no return, I would say. Yep. That was the change of the lifestyle. That was the change of everything. That is amazing too, because you got to see firsthand what happens when you change your diet. What's crazy to me is that we all wait for a sign in our stomach or in our intestines from a bloat to like a gas to a whatever it is to an upset tummy to cramps for us to be like, huh, maybe I'm allergic to this food or maybe my body doesn't really like this food or something like that. But it's so funny. We forget that all of our systems and our organs are intertwined. Skin is an organ, right? Like it's a huge, huge piece on our body and it tells us things about what we're eating and what we're feeling our body with. So it's just a really good reminder for everybody. I've been trying to be more intuitive with everything that I do, including like, what am I seeing in the mirror or on my skin when I'm eating something versus like, what just is my tummy telling me right after I eat? Cause yes, I get the cramps and all the things after dairy. I want to talk about dairy for a second too, because a lot of your videos were about dairy and the, and taking it into consideration as you talked about pizza for yourself, but Mm -hmm. What do we need to know about dairy and what are most people maybe ignoring when it comes to dairy in their skin? 
So there are quite a few studies that have linked dairy to acne. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that every single person that consumes dairy is going to get acne or that, you know, the cause of everyone's acne is dairy, but it is uh, a common denominator for a lot of people, myself included. And um, there's actually a couple of interesting studies. So one was a meta-analysis. This was published in 2018 in the journal Nutrients. And this pulled data from 14 different studies, okay? So all together, there were about 80,000 subjects, um, you know, being looked at. And the conclusion of this meta-analysis was that any dairy such as milk, yogurt, and cheese was associated with an increased odds ratio for acne in individuals between the ages of 7 and 30. Okay, so this is a big study. A We're big not talking about 10 people, 100 people. We're talking about 80,000 people and yeah. 14 studies. There was another study in uh, 1998. The Harvard researchers examined data from the Nurses Health Study, yeah. and this included about 50,000 um, women. And they found a positive association between milk consumption and teenage acne. And interestingly, those who consumed skim milk had a higher risk or higher chance of acne. Oh, interesting. So there, there is something there. And what I would say is, because listen, I'm Italian. So I grew up eating a lot of dairy and cheese. I mean, pretty much at every meal. Yes. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, when I was kind of told about this connection between dairy and acne. I was like, oh, come on. Yeah, sucks. exactly. Yeah. I was like, come on, like, kind of be something else, please. And so, uh, but I tried it, you know, and that's the thing. You can try it. Give yourself two weeks, okay? It, remove it for two weeks. And then you see how you feel, like what happens with your skin over those two weeks. And then like the real telling point is when you reintroduce it, on day 15. And you'll see again how your stomach reacts, how your skin reacts, how you feel, all of that. And that will be a good indicator whether it's sitting well with you or not. You may be pleasantly surprised and be like, oh, you know, my skin looked the same the whole time. And, uh, you know, it looks the same now that I added it back in. Okay, fine. Um, or you might find, oh my God, when I cut it out, my skin looked so much better. And when I added it back in, I broke out again. And what I will say is that there are many different causes of acne. Mm -hmm. Dairy could be one common trigger. Uh, sugar and refined carbohydrates or a yeah. high glycemic diet, that is the other one. So dairy and sugar, refined carbs, refined sugar, refined carbs, those are the two foods that have been um, pretty well linked in scientific studies to acne. Yes. So if you're, you cut out the dairy, but like you're still eating a ton of sugar and refined carbs, you may not be getting the results you're looking for because there's, you know, other things happening. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind, but yeah, definitely doing an elimination and reintroduction, yep. which you could do on your own, or you could also do with a nutritionist could be really helpful in kind of pinpointing whether this is an issue for you or not. Yeah. Where is it coming from? Which foods could it be? Cause for me, it is dairy. Um, like I talked about in the intro of this episode, it for sure is. My problem is, is I get a little excited. I get a little cocky and I'm like, you know what? I can have a little ice cream. I can have that pizza. Then my gut hurts and then my tummy is killing me and my whole digestive tract is irritated and I wake up and I am feeling very oily and I get zits in specific spots. Now I want to talk about acne. I think you called them acnogenic foods. But I also wanted to talk really quick about, you know, there, how there's like maps of your face. A lot of people talk about the maps on your face. Is that a real thing? Like is, is our face and where acne sits actually telling us what it's coming from or what part of our body is, is being irritated? So the acne maps, the facial maps, uh, Typically, those are kind of coming from traditional Chinese medicine, Yes, okay. um, which is, yeah, an incredible system for health and healing, you know, thousands of years old. They kind of observe that, yeah, certain breakouts in certain areas may be associated with certain imbalances in the body. Now, that said, how accurate they are, I don't know, because there's no studies to really show that. But what we do know, for example, is that hormonal acne definitely tends to um, congregate near the lower part of the face, like the jaw and the chin. Okay. Um, sometimes the forehead is more, uh, like, uh, digestion related. Um, and so I would say like looking 
at the, you know, what the pimple looks like. That could also be because mm. sometimes like you had mentioned before, like, how do we know if it's coming from inside or is it just our pillow or our makeup? Yes. And I feel like the ones that are coming from the outside that are from comedogenic products or, um, you know, things that we're putting on our face, those are those are like pimples, right? They're like little small white heads. They're usually not too bad. They usually come and go pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, like I know for me, you know, if I put on like a certain makeup, that's not agreeing with my skin in the morning, my skin is clear. And then I take it off and there's like a few like white spot, like white, you know, white heads. I'm like, okay, this is not for me. Very clearly um, like a clogged pore kind of thing. Yeah. Yes. But whereas acne, like those pimples are more coming from inside. And sometimes you feel them brewing days in advance or weeks mm. in advance. They're coming from the inside. They're a little bit more red. Usually you could still get a white head from the inside. But what I'm saying is like, th there's nothing that you put on your face, you know, to cause it. Right. Right. Um, so I think keeping a food and symptom diary is a great way to start drawing the connection. And I always tell people that you want to become a body detective and not just with your skin. I mean, with everything, if you get headaches, if you get cramps, if you get any sort of pains or bloating or any, any issue that you have in your body, start keeping track of it. And you could do it there are some apps that like food and symptom tracker yep. that you can get, or you can just keep a note in your phone, but you can start to draw or connect the dots, uh, you know, between, okay, when I feel this way, okay, what did I do beforehand? And sometimes it's clear, sometimes it's not really clear. And that's why working with a nutritionist can be helpful. Yeah. Um, but I do think it's really important that we do start paying attention to our body because our body is always trying to bring us into a state of health and equilibrium where everything is balanced, everything's working smoothly, you have energy, your skin is clear, your bowels are moving regularly, there's no issues. And so whenever we're off balance, it's kind of like our body's speaking to us and it's like, yeah. hey, slow down a second, Something, something's not right here, can you change something? And it's just a matter of figuring out, okay, what does that change need to be? Yeah, exactly. I love the way you put that too. And just being like, it is about being intuitive with your body, the whole whole thing. It's not just your skin talking. It's not just your tummy talking. It's not just your headache talking. All of the things are connected. So paying more attention to them, your body is telling you something and something is off. And that's what I've been trying to do too. And I encourage everyone to do it because I feel 100 times better. And my next journey is dairy free for my personal journey. That's me. That's what I know is bugging me. I need to listen to my body and I need to just do it. You talked about, it, it was in a TikTok too. I remember this because I was like, oh, very interesting. And you just mentioned it, bowel movement and being acne prone. What What is the connection there? Yeah. So it's quite fascinating, actually. There are two dermatologists almost a hundred years ago, um, John H. Stokes and Donald M. Pillsbury, who are kind of the forefathers. They set the foundation of what we now call the gut brain skin connection. Yes. Yes. And what they started to realize is that the acne patients tend to tended to have some gut disturbances and they tended to be more constipated. And they also um, found that they tend to be a little bit more stressed and anxious. And so they, they hypothesized that there was some link between mental stress and the gut and how the mental stress can actually disrupt the gut. And then that disruption was creating a disruption in the skin somehow it was creating oh. inflammation in the skin. And they were actually, um, you know, very early, they were uh, experimenting with probiotics. Now, they weren't called probiotics at the time, but they were cultures, like they were just cultured food. They were using lactobacillus strains in food. And they found that adding probiotic uh, rich food into the diet actually helped to reduce the acne. Interesting. And so, um, you know, and in the decades, so they did, you know, several studies and in the decades since, what we do know now about this gut brain skin connection is that there is a link and there's basically this two way communication between these three organs. So something that happens in your brain can actually show up in your skin. Stress acne is a real thing. This has been shown multiple studies. If you're stressed because of exams or, you know, whatever at work or whatever is going on in your life, what happens is the stressful thoughts can actually disrupt the gut by wiping out some of the good bacteria and the good bacteria in there, they help to, um, you know, keep your inflammation levels low, keep um, the, the bad bacteria, the opportunistic bacteria at bay. 
And so when you wipe them out, then the opportunistic bacteria have uh, more space to grow, right? And, um, and, and create inflammation. But that inflammation doesn't just stay in the guts. Everything's connected, right? So mm-hmm. it's body-wide and it can end up on the skin as acne. And in fact, this is also like an interesting fact that I feel like not a lot of people realize is that acne is considered an inflammatory skin disorder. So if you were to look up like what is acne, like that's how it's classified. It's not a bacterial infection. Everyone thinks it's a bacterial infection. And while bacteria may play some role in acne, it is not the first domino that sets off the whole chain of events of acne. And in fact, there have been studies. um, So like since the 1980s, that's when they first started like researchers first started to realize, okay, maybe it's not bacteria. Like in the 1950s, researchers thought it was bacteria. Mm -hmm. But in the 80s, that's when they started to realize "Mm, it might not be bacteria, it might actually be inflammation. And so several studies, you know, have kind of um, pointed in this direction. So um, one study has found that, uh, first of all, um, the bacteria that we were blaming for um, for acne, it used to be called P. acnes uh, bacteria, now it's called C. acnes, um, it's not always present. Like you can have acne and not have this particular bacteria on your skin. We also know that people with clear and healthy skin have this bacteria in the same amount. It, it, it is now considered a commensal or a good bacteria. So just the way that gut has a microbiome, your skin has a microbiome. Oh, yeah. And this ba- particular bacteria is one that is found even on clear, healthy skin. So um, the research has just kind of pointed to inflammation as that, like that first trigger. And, um, and that is why there, the, you know, there is enough evidence to suggest that inflammation is playing a huge, huge primary role in acne. And that's why it was in the early 2010s that acne was kind of reclassified as this uh, chronic inflammatory skin disorder. Okay. So you're inflamed, right? Like that's, that's what's, it's, something's bugging you. So I, and I don't want to knock anybody or anyone that's obviously giving out Accutane or these topical things, but really, truly it's, it's kind of like a cover up to the larger problem. And although I've never had severe, severe acne, so I can't say I wouldn't have jumped to Accutane if that was my, what felt like my only option at the time. So I, I can't even knock yeah. it. You know what I mean? Cause, and I know friends that have had a lot of success, success on it, but it's a of deeper course. rooted issue. Yeah. And you know what you're going to start to see in the future? This is my opinion. This is my sort of <laughs> crystal ball because I'm already seeing it in this, the research Eventually, they're going to start prescribing anti-inflammatory drugs for acne Um, because even with antibiotics, so back in the 1950s, based on the available science at the time, that is why antibiotics were prescribed for acne is because researchers believed that bacteria was causing the breakout. And, you know, they tried um, a few different uh, uh, types of antibiotics for acne. The first one didn't work. The second class did work. But... Anyway, in retrospect, now that we have kind of like decades of, of knowledge here, it's more likely the, the, the fact that the antibiotics that they're using for acne also has anti-inflammatory properties. That's why they're working while you're on them. Um, and that's really giving the benefit more so than the antimicrobial aspect of them. Um, and so a lot of times with antibiotics, People will get clear while they're on them for three months, but then once they go off after three, six months, maybe a year, this, you know, the issue comes back often with a vengeance. So people are kind of put on them again. And we do have to be careful with long-term antibiotic usage because there are, there are risks with that. You can get um, like pretty severe infection, like a C. difficile infection if you're on long-term antibiotics. Uh, and in fact, the American Academy of Dermatology, which kind of sets the, gui- the guidelines for dermatologists, they recommend that dermatologists don't prescribe their patients um, antibiotics for acne for more than three months. Yeah. So like that's kind of the, the cutoff. But yet in reality, the studies show people are like the average time people are on antibiotics for acne is 11 months. Oh, wow. So you just have to be careful. I definitely know people who have like, cause people write into me all the time, like people who have gotten ended up in the hospital with a C. difficile from taking oh antibiotics gosh. long-term. So it's not to say don't ever take antibiotics. It's just that there's a time and a place for them. And based on the science that we know now, there are better ways to tackle your acne by tackling inflammation um, versus going after a bacteria. Absolutely. I, I always 
hope that everybody can take the step back to, to look at it and be like, oh my gosh, what's actually going on here? But you can't again, right? Like if you, if that was felt like your only option and you felt like you've been battling this for so long and you know, you're already stressed and you're frustrated. I can't knock anybody for going to do that. And I know people that it's totally worked for. So just user discretion, right? Everybody like using the information that you have at your fingertips to support you in your decision-making. Okay. So we talk about clear skin. I have a ton, a ton of listener write-ins asking me, how the heck do I start getting clearer skin? How do I clean up my skin? How do I clear my skin? However you want to f- put it. Um, and in crew, instead of doing a whole call SID segment where we have you guys write in and I, you know, obviously we get advice and I answer your questions. I wanted to do like more of a rapid fire style. So I have a ton of listener write-ins and I appreciate every single one of you that writes in. Um, a lot of people were asking this exact question and they're saying, is it the apple cider vinegar that I need? Is it more greens? Are there foods that are just prone for clearer skin? I would just love your holistic view on all of that because it is, it's a loaded question and I, and there's a lot more to it. Yeah. So there's not one specific food that is like the panacea that is going to clear your skin overnight. Uh, but there are definitely like patterns of eating. So eating more anti-inflammatory foods, you can Google a list of that, but that's things like turmeric, ginger, uh, wild salmon, blueberries, dark leafy greens. These foods help to lower inflammation in your body. And so they're going to help to reduce inflammation in your skin as well. I will call out one food that I really, really love, which is ground flaxseed. And I feel like this particular food was very helpful for me when I had acne. I would use it in emergency situations when, you know, I had something important going on and I had a huge pimple. Um, Because what's great about flaxseed, ground flaxseed, is that first of all, it has fiber. So it's great for regularity. And kind of as we touched on before, we can go deeper into this, but constipation is linked to, um, you know, to breakouts. Uh, Secondly, it's rich in omega-3. So it has, uh, the omega-3 has anti-inflammatory properties. So that's really good. Um, And thirdly, like what's great about it is it just tastes good. Like it just makes whatever you add it to nutty. You could add it to smoothies, you could add salads. Uh, So yeah, so anti-inflammatory foods, eating more of those. Um, Nourishing your gut health. I think that's also really important. So fiber rich foods are going to help with that, like your vegetables, fruit, beans, lentils, probiotics, fermented foods. Um, All of these things are going to help and they're going to make a a really big difference. It's so funny because I've heard all of these things before and then I still get pimples and I question like, why did I get pimples? Oh, did it happen to do with the fact that I was traveling and I was eating out quite a bit? And I likely was eating a lot of foods that are not fiber dense because I just didn't have them at my fingertips. A lot of them cooked in a lot of seed oils, a ton of seed oils, because most restaurants do cook things in seed oils. And then what do you know is it pops up? And it's like, it is at most of the time, not all the time, as simple as your diet and as simple as being attentive to what you're putting in your body. Because if you think about your little body, it's just a little engine. And Marie and I were talking about this before we started. It's like, it's just a little engine. It, it only has what it's being put into it. And when it doesn't get the food that it wants, like really, really overly processed foods, it starts to backfire. And it starts to tell you by getting rid of the things wherever it can, whether it be through your gut whether it be through your skin, whether it be with a headache that like is, you know, the chemicals moving through your body. So I know it sounds crazy. I know you're like, what? It can't be just the food. It sometimes and most of the times actually really is just the food. So I encourage everybody listening to like take notes right now and and make a few decisions where, you know, usually I have just like a piece of bread. Why don't I try um, a different type of breakfast, maybe with blueberries and different things like that or a smoothie? Don't complicate it. Just make it a little more accessible. Um, yes. Just can I add one? Oh yes, thing of course you can. Absolutely. Yes. You can. Okay. So uh, another, um, you know, food plays a huge, huge role in acne. There, are, there are many factors. I like to say there are six primary ones: nutrient deficiencies, a pro-inflammatory diet, gut dysbiosis, uh, stress and hormonal imbalances. The sixth one I would say is overly harsh skincare, but like the other five, you can really, you can all tackle it, even with stress. Certain foods, like if you're stressed out and you're having a lot of caffeine, that's just gonna exacerbate the issue, right? Because it's gonna um, affect your cortisol levels. And cortisol, like too much cortisol can actually make your your skin more oily. So it's it's all these like, um, everything's connected in your 
body. So food plays a really big part. Um, but also, yeah, also your gut health. Like I think that our health, uh, really it starts in the gut and not just our skin, our immune system, our mood, um, sorry, mood, our mood, um, everything is really originating from the gut. So it's really important that we're nourishing the gut and having, um, you know, probiotic rich foods or taking probiotics, um, having fiber on a regular basis, drinking enough water to make sure everything's running smoothly. Yeah, exactly. And I know you talk about just all of those different things, but how they all start in the gut. It's like how, if you were a listener, maybe with that's just trying to go on this journey, how would you do process of elimination or how would you suggest to do process of elimination with like, is it my stress? Is it my diet? Is it the, all of the things that you named off and you listed like the fab five almost, how would Mm -hmm. you go backwards and be like, Oh, this is what it is. Well, the first place I'd start, like I'd start with the low hanging fruit. So I think like if you're stressed, you kind of know you're stressed, right? Like, you know, if you're <laughs> like your job, you know, is, is stressing you out or your life is stressing you out. I think you kind of like, so I will, I will say not everybody knows, like some people True. know they're really stressed out. Other people, like, I also feel like for me, I was like, no, I'm not stressed out. Like, meanwhile, same. like, you know, I, I definitely was. Oh, I'm the same um, way. I'm like, I'm lying to yeah, myself, I'm like, but <laughs> I'm handling it. Like I'm still alive. Like I get up, I get through my day like I'm fine and it's like no you were like under massive (laughs) stress and um but I would say like start with what you can add in right so adding in those anti-inflammatory foods if you're like okay I don't eat berries I don't eat dark leafy greens I don't know what turmeric is like you know add some of those in and um I have a great recipe on my website for a five spice salmon it's called and it's it's really simple to make it's wild salmon with like turmeric cumin cayenne um Two other things. And basically, um, it's it's very anti-inflammatory. So pairing that with some greens, whatever you like, broccoli, kale, whatever you want, um, maybe some brown rice, make it a meal. You will feel different after you eat this. If you eat this for dinner, when you wake up in the next morning, see how your skin looks, see Mm -hmm. how you feel. You're going to feel different than if you're usually like I used to having like either takeout or, you know, a frozen pizza or something in the microwave. There Um, is such thing as like a food hangover and I feel it. So I'm completely agreeing with you and I'm, it's not like a bunch of baloney, you guys, it is a real thing. Mm -hmm. You can tell and you can feel it. So first I would just I would just add in some healthier foods if you're not eating enough of them. Try to make half your plate vegetables. That's another kind of like easy hack. Don't change anything else that you're eating yet. Just make half your plate vegetables. Mm -hmm. Have a start with a salad. Start with a vegetable soup if you're eating out. Um, You know, just fill your your plate. and Whatever you put on the other side, we'll tackle that later. But just start getting your fiber in. Um, another thing would be upgrading. So like I was addicted to sugar when I was breaking out, I was eating cookies, I was eating candy, I was eating like all the sweet things. And I thought there was no way that I could ever get off of sweets. And you can. And the way that you do that is you upgrade them. So whatever it is that you like now. So if you like, let's say cookies, right? Find a healthier recipe for a cookie or a healthier cookie brand, which uses less sugar or a better sugar. Maybe it's sweetened with monk fruit or dates or whatever. So that way you feel like you're eating a cookie, but it's a better cookie for you. Uh, one recipe that I used to make that really helped me get over my sweet cravings was banana ice cream, oh. uh, which is, uh, you just basically take frozen bananas. You, uh, put them in the blender, high speed blender with like cacao powder, nut butter, that's it. You got chocolate ice cream and like in one minute and it's delicious. You literally feel like you're eating soft serve ice cream. So you don't feel deprived. So upgrading your favorite foods that also goes for savory stuff like chips and pretzels and all of that. I love that. Yeah. So I would definitely start there. And then, um, you know, working on the gut health, I would work on the stress. So I, I always say meditation is skincare. And I know there's a lot of resistance to meditation because I had it as well for many years. And I was like, there's no way I'm sitting for 10 minutes, oh my gosh, 20 I, minutes to, I'm in the to same do boat. that. I have too many things to do. But it's really like if you can get into it, and I recommend you can go on YouTube. There's so many apps now where you can get a guided meditation. That's definitely the easiest way in. And um, if you don't like one that you listen to, don't stop there. Like there's so many different teachers, right? It's like going to a fitness class. Like some instructors you really like, some not so much. Yep. So find an instructor you like and um, just try it. And even five or ten minutes can make a difference. And it's not just a difference while you're doing it. It's the difference for the rest of the day because yes. it kind of takes your stress down a level and you're a bit more calm throughout the day and you just react to things in a better in a better way, more calmly. 
I love that too. And I had been resistant to, resistant to meditation. I got on it during COVID. My skin was the happiest it's ever been. That's not a lie. And I kind of fell off of it and I've been seeing flare ups and I kind of, you know, I've been a little less quote unquote strict with myself. So I'm, this is like a good reminder for me too, to be like, okay, time to get back into it. I loved five minutes a day. I think I used the, either the calm app or I think there was one called breathe or something like that, that I preferred a little more. I'll find it and I'll link it in my, in the description of this episode, but I love all of those tips. And truly it's, about being receptive to a little bit more of a well-rounded lifestyle. And I like, I hate to point the finger at people, but I've been there too, even with my, like, I keep talking about it, but it's true. It's just very present and real. The dairy resistance that I had of like, I know this is hurting my body. I can feel it hurting my body yet. I'm still doing it. So just try to be less resistant to the new healthy ideas that maybe you've heard over and over again. Maybe this is the first time you're hearing it, but be less resistant and do yourself a favor and pick one thing to take away from this and like just do, right? Like not all, just yeah. one. Don't overdo it. Just we, one. We get, we get all in our, biz, you know, panties in a wad when we're like, oh my God, too much information, TMI. I get it. Just one. Do one thing, one thing at a time. And I always say baby steps lead to big results. Yes. And so, and it's also about experimenting, you know, like maybe something doesn't work for you. And look, maybe you're like, I hate meditation. This stuff sucks. Like I'm not going to do it. Okay. Do something else. There's so many other ways to reduce our stress. Yes. Um, you know, going in nature, um, yoga, breath work. I love breath work. That's also really short. You could do that like mm-hmm. and have results in a minute. Um, so there's so many different modalities, but I think in this day and age, no matter what you do, where you are, like there is a level of stress that I think humans have that oh maybe goodness. we didn't have 100, 200 years ago, uh, just because the constant news cycle and the social media and all the pressure to look a certain way and, and all of oh, this yes. stuff, it's just like heightened everything. I think the number of people who have like anxiety and and just stress issues and depression, all this stuff, it's, it's elevated because of the way that we're living, like just because of the world we're in, I should say. Absolutely. And so it is important that you know, if you really want to feel your best and it's not even only about health, like health is a part of it. And like, right. for me, that's really important, but maybe you're like, okay, I really want to do really well in my career or mm-hmm. whatever the case is. You're going to do the best in your career when you feel good, when you have energy, um, when you don't have brain fog, right? How are you going to be creative and get work done if your brain is foggy all the time? Yep. So you can kind of find out what your goal is and like what you want to achieve and then focus on that as like the reason for making the changes for a healthier lifestyle. I love that too. It's like, it doesn't have to be the the acne or it doesn't have to be whatever it is that you're thinking about. It can be something completely different. And one thing we didn't even mention is the simplest of things too. Like you, you talk about meditation as like another thing of like, if it's not just foods, making your schedule, something that is attainable and doable and like not a scrambled mess because I am guilty of that where I make a schedule and, or I ignore my schedule and I don't really organize it to make myself in a stress situation. I know that I've, maybe I've planned a podcast a little too close to a meeting or whatever it is. And then all of a sudden I've created this anxiety and stress around my day that could have been prevented by me planning ahead just like this much more. It's like remove the stress, however you feel fit, but find something whether it be your body or your mind to change. Right. So I love all of this. These tips are like perfect takeaways and things that I've changed in my lifestyle and also things that I need a reminder to change in my lifestyle. I want to do, I know we're getting towards the end, but I want to do some rapid fire of like questions that I, people wrote in or things that I saw on your TikTok. because if you haven't already gone and followed Maria Merlot, um, you will find some things that I'm sure you're like, I had no idea like the carrot. Can we just really quick talk about the carrot conversation and how it quote unquote maybe makes you tanner? And if this is true, because I was like, what? A carrot a day? It is true. Yeah. So carrots contain carotenoids, right? You've heard of beta carotene and our, we store these carotenoids underneath our skin. So you might've heard there were some studies recently about tomatoes and lycopene, like offering UV protection from the sun a little bit. I'm not saying it replaces the sun, but it's because these, um, the carotenoids are stored underneath the skin. And so, um, with the carrot, like um, if you're eating carotenoid-rich foods like carrots, sweet potatoes, anything orange on a regular basis, mm-hmm. 
you're storing a lot of those carotenoids under your skin. So it gives you more of a healthy glow. Um, oh. And uh, yeah, it just makes you look like have a little bit more of a tan, a carrot tan. You a can go overboard. You can turn orange. So this happens sometimes in babies when they're eating too oh. many carrots, they can actually turn orange and look a little bit more like a palumpa, but it's harmless. So you would just have to stop eating them for a while. So you don't want to overdo it. Like don't be eating a bag of carrots a day, two carrots, totally fine. Do that, you know, and it doesn't have to be carrots. It could be sweet potato. It could be butternut squash. It could be whatever. I mean, even dark leafy greens have um, carotenoids in them. So you don't have to be obsessive with it, but it does, you know, and like, we know this from a common sense perspective, right? Like if someone's really pale, we're like, oh, you look a little bit sick, yes. right? And maybe they're, they're not eating a healthy diet. Um, they might not have enough iron. Um, maybe they're not eating enough vegetables. Um, and so, yeah, so it's just like a little little hack or a little um, perk for eating your vegetables. That is so funny. I'm like, what the heck? I saw that. I'm like, there's no way that's real. It's totally real because it is just the chemical or, you know, the the thing in the carrot that makes it change in your body. Not a bad chemical. Not every ba- chemical is bad. Um, I, that is, that is funny. I've never heard of that before. And I saw it. I'm like, what are you talking about? This is crazy. More carrots well, if for you me look then. At pictures, if you look at pictures of me, like when I was, um, I mean, I'm actually a little bit pale now, but when I was younger, like when, you know, when I was eating only junk food, I mean, I was Casper the friendly ghost. I was oh, practically yeah. see-through. And when I started eating healthier, you can see pictures of me. My skin is naturally like a couple shades darker. Just it, it, It's not that I look very tan. It's just that I look healthier. Like my skin has color to it. Yes. It's not so pale. Oh my God. That is insane. Well, I'm going to be adding a few carrots to my diet. That's for sure. I already like carrots. I shave them over your salad. You'll never even taste them. If you're like, I don't like carrots, shave them over your salad. It will be tasty. Okay. Rapid fire. I see the conversation about getting rid of acne scars at home. And I know you tried I, I feel like I've seen you try a few like um, random like flaxseed masks and different things like that. It doesn't have to be that holistic, obviously. But is there yeah. a way for us, you know, the acne has already um, happened. How do we so, do that? Yeah. So there is an ingredient I really like. It's called Bacuchiol. And it's um, it's pregnancy safe, but it's kind oh. of been compared to like um, retinoids. Um, and what it's been shown, it's been shown to um, reduce hyperpigmentation. Oh, yeah. And uh, it's also really good for wrinkles as well. So that, it, and it's non-irritating. So like retinoids can cause some dryness and irritation. It's non-irritating. So that's something that I like for um, at home for reducing. It does take time. Like it's not going to work overnight. That's right. something I like. Um, if you want to get rid of your scars faster, I would say going to a licensed esthetician, they'll have a lot more options for you and Agreed. things that will work a little bit quicker. Yep. I totally agree. Like, uh, you know, depending on the scars, obviously chemical peel or like microneedling, which I got done just a few weeks ago and my skin is absolutely the happiest it's been in a long time. So just bringing that collagen to the top. So I would say, yeah, figure out the level that you want to go And, um, also what's affordable, right? But remember everything and all of these things take time because they are scars and that's okay. So just know that it's going to take a little bit, but taking steps forward, you'll see a lot more, um, you know, steps forward in the future too. Um, okay. Let's see. So this one I, I can relate to. It says I only flare up during my period. Is this normal? It's common. It's very common. But just because you have a period doesn't mean you have to break out. So there could be a couple of things at play. One, if you only break out, if you're clear like the rest of the month and then you only break out around ovulation or around your period, I would say maybe your liver needs a little bit of support. That could be something to look into because our liver, um, our liver helps to, uh, break down excess hormones and excrete them from the body. So especially if you're breaking out around ovulation, like two weeks before your period, uh, definitely eat some more cruciferous vegetables, eat some more bitter foods. These are really good for your liver um, and going to help your body to you know, process those excess hormones and get rid of them. The other aspect is constipation. So even if your wow. liver is working really well, but you're constipated, then what happens is once you, so your liver will break down the excess hormones and then package them up in your stool to be excreted out of the body. But if you're constipated, those excess hormones can actually get reabsorbed from your gut back into your bloodstream, control contributing to imbalances. So it's really important that you're eating enough fiber, like eat your dark leafy greens when you're, you know, really all month long, but you know, maybe you you remember specifically to eat them, you know, around your period or ovulation. 
um, because that's, yeah, that's going to help kind of on, on both fronts. Yeah. And just try it. Why not try it? If that's a problem that you're running into, because I always thought I definitely had that going on. I had to have, it's just a part of the process, right? You get your period, you have acne. That's just how it goes. I don't really run into that anymore, which is kind of crazy. And it just so happened that it was in my T zone, which, which you were talking about means is it, it would be gut related to be digestion related. You, so, yeah. so to speak, mm-hmm. right? Like usually. Right. And it just yeah. so happened that my gut was probably the worst it had been. And so was my diet around that time. So anyway, I just, I share that because I've seen it and I've made the connections after the fact. And I think if I would have made them earlier, I could have made a lot more changes earlier. So I love that you called that yeah. out too. This one was, oh, oily skin. This is a good conversation to have because I hear it all the time. I have oily skin. I have oily skin. What do you do with oily skin? You probably add a really, really harsh exfoliant or a stripping um, soap. Is oily skin actually something we have to deal with? So oily skin is not a type of skin. It is a state of skin. So we all are born with normal skin, which can become more or less oily or more or less dry, depending on several factors. One of them is environment, uh, but another really big one is our diet and our lifestyle. So studies show certain foods, any food that increases the hormone IGF-1 can increase your oil production. So that's high glycemic foods. That's the Mm -hmm. sugar. That's the refined carbohydrates. This may be why skim milk. Remember I mentioned skim milk is more, tends to be more, even more associated with acne risk than, than regular like whole fat milk. And that's because skim milk is going to be higher glycemic than whole milk, which still has the fat intact. And so, um, yeah, you want to keep your blood sugar stable. This is like the other, like a really, really, really big thing. And for like people who are like, oh, but I eat so healthy. Um, I don't know why I'm breaking out. I would say, look, like really look at your diet because sometimes like if you're having instant oatmeal for or oatmeal for, you know, breakfast and then you're having like a sandwich for lunch and I, you know, I don't know, pasta for dinner, or maybe you're having salmon for dinner, but you're having like pretzels and crackers for a snack. Like these can be spiking your blood sugar. Right. And so, um, you, you really want to keep for clear skin, you really want to keep your, your blood sugar stable. And for normal oil production, you want to keep your, your blood sugar stable and your cortisol, cortisol, like high levels of cortisol can also cause you to produce more oil and, you know, can, can contribute to breakouts. Stress and sugar. Making sure you're keeping your stress. (laughs) Yeah. Making sure you're keeping your stress in track. And I will say, if you do have stress acne or you're just like stressed, uh, green tea may help. Because research shows that can actually um, reduce cortisol levels. Oh, I love that. I love that little takeaway. I didn't know that. Um, I see the harsh scrubs question. Is this yes. something we should be using, right? Because we're told you, no. you should be no. using toner. Or you should. Um, we should exfoliate, but I'd like you to talk about that real quick. So my opinion is probably an unpopular opinion. Like I'm like the anti 10 step skincare. I'm like, do nothing to your face. Like just leave it alone. Like use minimal, minimal, like very gentle, natural products. Yes. Um, when we are overly harsh with our skin and we use products that strip away too much oil or all the oil on our face, the reality is we need some oil. Like the oil is what makes your skin glow, what makes your skin supple, right? And so when we strip all of it away, our skin becomes tight and then our, our skin actually overcompensates by producing more oil, not less. So you kind of get on this hamster wheel where your your skin is like producing all this oil and then you're stripping it all away and then it's producing more and then it's kind of like this bad cycle. So Uh, I like also a game changer for me was focusing more on my food and then getting rid of all that stuff that was irritating Mm -hmm. my skin and using gentle, like a very gentle cleanser, uh, you know, very gentle serums or whatever else you want to put on a very gentle moisturizer, like no actives or minimal actives. And, uh, and, and that's it. And let my diet and lifestyle do the heavy lifting. It really, it makes a world of difference. That is so helpful too. I just, yeah, I, it's hard when you hear people that they're stripping their skin so hard too. And it's like, you know, the problem is probably coming from within. So, um, you stripping the top of your skin and really attacking well, it's hurtful. It. Yeah. Well, yeah. And what happens like with my skin, you know, even like if I use something really harsh, like even vitamin C serum, I know everyone loves vitamin C serum. 
if I use vitamin C serum, I start getting like little bumps on my face, like little, it's too harsh. It's just too harsh for my skin. Yeah. And so, you know, those little tiny, like you don't really see them if you're far away, but if you look in the mirror and you look in the light, you're like, oh my God, why do I have all these bumps on my face? It could be because your product is too harsh and it's yes. just disrupting your skin barrier. And keep in mind, like your skin barrier has a really important job. It's protecting you from invaders, from pathogens. Um, and so when we use too many products that are exfoliating all of that away, our skin is going to become more sensitive. And, yes. you know, you may be re more reactive to products. Um, and so, yeah, just uh, try try the gentle method. If, mm -hmm. if the current method, if you're using a lot of actives and your skin like looks angry or it's dry or oily, like has like all these imbalances, just try like chilling, like Chill. let your skin chill for a little bit. <laughs> use some gentle, gentle, natural stuff. And, uh, and and see what happens. I like the call out. Just have some chill skin. Just chill out. Just chill for a second. <laughs> um, few more questions and then we'll, we'll wrap up. But I also struggle with this too. So I'd be curious your thoughts on this because I've gotten many different perspectives of this. And I have a lot of listeners that also struggle with it. Psoriasis. So it is very obviously it's an autoimmune disorder. It is gut related. They know that it's related to that. It can make things flare. Um, what have you just heard from, you know, your knowing and being mm -hmm. in nutrition, um, things that can help it or maybe make it flare up even more? Yeah. So with any sort of autoimmune condition, whether it's skin or not, um, there is this gut factor that is believed to pay, play a pivotal role in kind of creating the issue. And so, um, you know, a lot of functional medicine doctors will talk about the link between leaky gut and uh, and autoimmune conditions. Because what's mm -hmm. happening when you have leaky gut, your intestinal barrier is more permeable. So typically, the contents in your gut they stay in your gut and right. they go out the other end. Um, but the you know the nutrients are absorbed into the bloodstream. But when you have a leaky gut, that barrier is a little bit thinner. It's a little bit looser. So other things can start leaking into your bloodstream beyond just the nutrients oh. and, you know, bacteria, you know, maybe food particles, whatever it is. And so, um, that then your immune system is mounting a response to that. And that's creating, you know, what we call an autoimmune response. So it is really important if you have psoriasis, first place to start. And this is for any inflammatory skin issue yeah. and any autoimmune issue. Start with the gut. Start with the gut and I would really recommend, you know, go to a functional medicine doctor. Mm -hmm. They can, you know, do testing and they can give you like a whole protocol. It is really important that you're starting with the gut because, uh, you know, adding anti-inflammatory foods, yes, you know, do that as well. But like you have to heal that gut lining in order to have relief. Yeah. So I would say, yeah, starting with the gut, making sure you're nourishing your gut microbiome with probiotics, with um, you know, with fiber, uh, and, uh, yes. And, you know, different herbs you could use. So I would definitely say like, start there. And of course, again, kind of keep a food diary. Like you'll see the foods that flare you, um, dairy might be problematic. Sugar and refined carbs are going to be problematic. Gluten, you know, in particular for psoriasis could be problematic. Yep. So I would keep that food and symptom, you know, journal, and, and you can start to see, you know, for yourself, when, how does your skin look after you eat these foods versus those foods? I always got bummed because I'm like, oh my God, no, all the fun things are the things that hurt my body. And like <laughs> vis visibly that and also hurting my body. But then I realized that if I'm going to think of one skill that's going to help me with all the things, it's my gut and it's cooking. And so I started cooking and obviously I started, you start cooking and the meals are not very great. And you're like, mm, I'm really disappointed. I really want to go buy something out. And then you start cooking more and you start experimenting more and saving recipes on Instagram or following a nutritionist like yourself. And then all of a sudden the food that you cook at home is not only better for you, it makes you feel better. It tastes better than a restaurant because you've just practiced. And I'm telling you right now, that has been a, even a key in like making my skin happier, making my gut happier, my psoriasis happier. So now I always tell people that. It takes practice, but it is worth it because I would rather have kind of mediocre, medium meals for like six months until I figure it out and be able to know how to nourish my body than not be able to do that at all and only find happiness in foods that I eat out when I don't even know what oils are in it and all these things. And I'm not going to lie. I still eat out. So don't, I'm not saying cut it out. You can still enjoy yourself. I'm just saying yeah. for the day to day, that's also not affordable either. 
So, um, just some little nuggets of information that I think are very helpful. Um, yes. And let me, can I add yeah. a couple oh, yeah. you always that, can that add. so well said. Of course. Thank yeah, you. So, um, thank you. So first of all, you know, I think like I was the same where I was like, oh my God, all the fun foods are gone. Like what am I going to eat this bland like carrot stick? And, and no, you know, that's not the case. Like healthy food can actually take, taste delicious. It's a matter of, you know, cooking it properly and it doesn't have to be time consuming e- either. Um, using spices, for example, that's like a really easy way to improve the flavor. Yes. And if, you know, in those early months while you're experimenting and getting used to in the, ki- you know, used to being in the kitchen, have some sauce, like whether you like hot sauce or some salad dressing, whatever you like, if it doesn't come out that great, just douse it in that sauce yes. and it'll taste good. And you know, you saved, you saved the day. So, um, yeah, just be like, you're going to mess up. Like I still mess up. Like sometimes I'm trying to make something and like, it doesn't come out good. So it's okay. You know, keep trying and just try to have like a, a chill, uh, like, uh, approach to, to cooking. Oh yeah. Um, the second thing is, You know, if you're finding, you know, you have a lot of food sensitivities and like even with the dairy, once you work on healing your gut and improving your um, intestinal permeability, improving your gut microbiome, becoming regular, you may actually find that your tolerance for certain foods improves. So now if you have an allergy, no, this does not imply. But if you just have a sensitivity to something, so like, for example, for me, I have a sensitivity to dairy. But now after so many years of like nourishing my gut, if I eat dairy, like I'm okay. If I eat dairy every single day for a week, okay, then I'm going to get a pimple. But there's a threshold now that is, is a larger threshold than before. So, you know, keep that in mind. And, um, yeah. And I think just over time it gets easier. So find the recipes you like. It doesn't have to take forever. Find a 10 or 20 minute recipe and you, you, once you feel better, you'll be more inspired or inspired even more to get into the kitchen. I love that so much. You talked about pre and probiotics, and I know that a lot of people wrote in asking about them. What is the way that you get your pre and probiotics in? Because there's always been this confusion of you need a prebiotic to get your probiotic to be active. Is it just in yogurt? What if I'm, you know, lactose intolerant or maybe what if I don't know if I'm taking a probiotic as a supplement, if it's actually an active ingredient where the prebiotic will activate it? All of those questions I hear. What do you do as a nutritionist, right? So first, let's just define quickly probiotic and prebiotic in case not everyone is aware. So probiotic is the good bacteria that are going to support a healthy gut microbiome, support healthy digestion and beyond. Because with healthy digestion and a healthy gut microbiome, you also have better immunity, better skin, better mood, etc. Prebiotics are essentially the food for the probiotics. They're the fuel. So um, that they come from fiber. And um, so the probiotics traditionally were found in fermented foods. So yes, Mm -hmm. yogurt is probably like one of the most common or popular fermented foods, but the reality is a lot of the yogurts on the market, first of all, they're loaded with sugar and, um, they're, you know, they're, they're not, uh, they're not going to be the best source of probiotics. If you are looking for food sources of probiotics, um, I would go for things like sauerkraut, kimchi, your fermented, your Mm -hmm. lacto fermented vegetables, but there again, you know, in this day and age, sometimes things are like quick pickled. Um, and so they're using vinegar to get that tangy taste instead of actually fermenting the vegetable, which takes time. So make sure when you're looking for fermented foods, they're actually lacto fermented. And typically the ingredient list will have, you know, let's say cucumbers and uh, salt, for example, and that's it. There's no vinegar in there. Um, and they'll usually be in the refrigerator section. Yep. So you can get your probiotics from there. Prebiotics you can get from fiber rich foods. So things like uh, green bananas or plantains, those are like my favorites. Um, apples, onions, garlic, um, oats, right? There's so many different fiber rich foods um, that you can, you can get your prebiotics from. Now, in order to really get enough prebiotic, oh, sorry, probiotics, you kind of need to eat them daily, especially again in our daily modern life where we're constantly stressed and, you know, maybe we're eating out more and all of that stuff. So about an ounce of fermented foods daily, if you're not getting that, then I would recommend taking a probiotic supplement for sure. And then prebiotics, I prefer getting them from food, um, but you can also find prebiotics in supplement form. Sometimes you'll find a probiotic with a prebiotic. Um, and I will say like for acne prone skin, there are a couple of strains that are really beneficial. 
So L-Rhamnosus SP1, okay. that has been shown in a clinical trial to reduce adult acne in 12 weeks. LS Adophilus, this is probably one of the first strains studied for skin clarity, so that's another good one. You also want some bifidobacterium strains. Those are going to help with constipation. And uh, I'm like such a huge fan of probiotics because they played such a big part in my own journey. I actually started a probiotic company um, and created a pro probiotic called Glow Biome, which oh my is gosh, I specifically know that. formulated... Yeah, specifically formulated for acne prone skin to, um, you know, support gut health and support skin health by first supporting your gut health. Oh my gosh. Okay. Say the company name one more time, just so people can hear it again. Yeah. So the company is called Kuma, K-U-M-A, but the product is Glow Biome. Glow Biome. And it's, yeah, it's really, really amazing for skin health. I'm going to link that. I'm going to type it in right now so I don't forget. Um, that's amazing because I, some people, you know, getting it in every day, it's not, it's not easy, especially when we're changing our diets in our direction of our diet. So I get it. If you're like, that's a lot of pressure to say, I'm going to have an, um, part of an onion or an apple a day, you'll get there. And there's no hurt in adding a supplement that the supplements have been proven to be an amazing thing. So even just after getting my blood work done, I'm like, I need a few supplements, including like a probiotic for my gut, like a vitamin D. I need a multivitamin. I need a little magnesium. So like, don't, don't shame supplements. Cause I used to, um, they're beautiful for your body, beautiful for your body coming from a nutritionist and someone in fitness at a healthcare company or excuse me, health company. Yes. Okay. And they're a supplement. That's exactly yeah. it. They're a supplement. So you still want to have the healthy diet and lifestyle, but they're a good insurance policy to, you know, make sure you're getting what you need. Exactly. Um, quick for our last few ones, I saw a video about reversing gray hair. Can you just quick talk yes. about this? Because I was yes. uh, shocked and being somebody who's seen a few gray hairs pop up, I was like, please give me more information. Yes. So there were um, a couple of case studies on this where uh, like a doctor had a patient where he had like, um, you know, gray hair on the top, but uh, at the root, it was growing in back his natural color, black or brown. And so he had, he had like a stressful job, but then I think he'd went on like a very long vacation or something like that. And they're like, okay, maybe it's just like reducing the stress has reduced the gray. And we all know that stress can, you know, is associated with premature graying. We also know that um, heavy metals can contribute to gray hair and a lack of certain nutrients. Um, in particular, uh, things like copper, iodine, uh, B12, vitamin B12, vitamin D, um, iron. So if you're low in any of these nutrients, it doesn't have to be all of them. It could be one of them oh, wow. um, that could be contributing to gray hair. And that if you have a deficiency, adding the nutrient back in may help to reverse it. And of course, reducing your stress. And so I have a whole blog post on this. They've actually done a clinical trial um, on the stress re reduction aspect. Also just reducing your stress has been shown in more than a case study, actually in a, a clinical study um, to reverse gray hair. Oh my God. I love hearing this though. Cause that is just the coolest thing I've ever heard. I'm like, I thought when you were starting to go gray, it's like, yep. And too bad. So sad. So I love that. I'm, I'm going to literally go read this blog post right after this too. Cause I'm like, I want to know more, but that is so helpful. My last and final question, because I always ask this when I talk to somebody about um, food or nutrition or anything like that is what does a normal day of nutrition look like to you? Because we've talked about, you know, foods that are going to help people get rid of that acne. And like, sometimes people just need a blatant example of what does a day of eating look like to you where you get all this encompassing, you know, acne, so to speak, free foods and um, happy gut foods. Yeah. So for breakfast, I like to start with eggs. They're like one of my favorite foods. So yep. I'll usually start with three eggs and some other source of protein because I'm trying to hit that 30 grams of protein. Love. So sometimes it'll be like one to two chicken sausages, like organic, you know, free range, all of that. Um, so I'll have that. And I like to uh, add some veggies. So like if I have just some cherry tomatoes, I'll chop them up really quick and scramble them with my eggs, maybe some onion, uh, some herbs, whatever I can throw in there. I just try to get a little bit veggie in there. I don't do it every day, but I try to. So at least I'm getting some fiber in in the morning. So that would be breakfast. Another alternative for breakfast, I like to do a blueberry smoothie Yum. and I add, make sure I have that 30 grams of protein. So I'll add, uh, you know, like a plant protein powder, which has about 20 grams of um, protein. And then I add 10 grams of um, protein from collagen, grass-fed collagen powder. Have that in the morning. And I've worn my continuous glucose monitor and saw keeps your blood sugar like nice and stable yep. when you add the protein. Um, for lunch, I like to mix it up. 
you know, sometimes I'll do like a sat, like a big salad, for example, with some source of protein. Maybe it's a wild salmon. Um, maybe it's chicken. Maybe it's whatever, but just something easy and quick. So usually it's like a big salad with some sort of protein. And then for dinner, that's where I, you know, maybe spend a little bit more time. And so, um, something we had recently, I make this, um, like a garlic ginger beef stir fry oh. bowl. So I love, I feel like if you just cook anything with garlic, um, garlic, onions, or ginger, like it tastes good. Yeah. So I usually just stir fry some chopped grass fed beef with, um, onions and sorry, garlic and ginger and, uh, I think scallions and maybe a couple of spices stir fry that. And then in a separate, um, pan, I would make either cauliflower rice or regular rice and also add some garlic and ginger and spices make that and it's like basically ready in 10 minutes. That sounds delicious. Those are all amazing meals too. And they're, they're protein forward, which is like a big positive. Like you can still get your protein in when you're, you're prioritizing veggies and good food. So I love all of this. This is like chef's kiss and I'm going to go make that protein bowl or I call it protein bowl, but anything with like beef, that's like a stir fry or a bowl. I'm always like, Ooh, protein bowl. Yummy. Maria, thank you so much. This was helpful for me. This is going to be helpful for my listeners. We basically answered every write-in question. I like compiled them and I'm like happy to say we hit them majority of them, almost every single one of them. So I really appreciate it. I appreciate your knowledge that you're willing to share. Where can people find you? I'm going to link your website and I'll bring um, and your company, your um, probiotic, but where else can they find you if they're looking for you and want to know more? Uh, yeah, so I would say social media is a great place. So I'm on Instagram at Maria Marlowe and on TikTok, Glow by Marlowe. And Marlowe is spelled M-A-R-L-O-W-E. And then my website has tons of info and recipes, uh, anti-inflammatory, low glycemic load recipes. And that's just my name, mariamarlowe.com. Awesome. I love it. Well, this was helpful. Like I'm truly excited to add some more recipes in my diet because I I would say I have a good diet, but I could be a little bit better about being more... Um, I guess mindful of like probiotic foods and anti-inflammatory foods and you're hearing it here. I've said it a million times. I am stopping my dairy because I know it's a problem. I've been told it's a problem over and over again, and I'm going to see what happens and I'll, I'll report back. I'm doing it for me. Finally, I'm ready. So Maria, thank you. I appreciate you. I appreciate your time. Um, I can't wait to continue learning from you and I'm hyped to hear how my listeners, what they thought, cause this is exciting. Let, thank you so much for having me on. And yeah. this is a great conversation it and was. great question. Everyone, thank you for uh, writing in. I know. I appreciate it. Everyone, if you wrote in um, or you maybe want to write in, my number is 612-470-7569. You can text it. You can call me. If you're overseas, you're going to need to go to the link in bio, type into the get advice, and I can answer your questions. Remember, it's all things about life. I'm going with this theme of self and health. So if it's related to the relationship with self or relationship with health, it's a question welcome here, whether that be relationships, food, um, life and career, lifestyle, those are all encompassing of what I talk about. So if you've got a question about that, write into me, go over to YouTube, please subscribe. It helps me. It helps all of the people that come on my podcast too. So we can get them more views, get them to more eyes. Um, and I will see you next week. Thank you again, Maria. Thanks for having me. Bye everybody.